And we are now live, Madam Chair, if you'd like to call the meeting to order. Very good. I call this meeting of the Arapahoe County Planning Commission of October 20, 20th of 2020 to order. And we will now call the roll. Thanks, I believe Chair. we have our quorum. Yep. Chair Rick? Present. Chair Pro Tem Latsis? Present. Commissioner Brockelman? Present. Commissioner Miller? Present. Commissioner Saul? Present. Commissioner Save? Present. Commissioner Woolman? Present. Uh, we have seven members of the Planning Commission present this evening, and as the Chair mentioned, we do have a quorum. Good evening, Commissioner, staff, citizens, and guests. I'm Jason Reynolds with Arapahoe County Planning, and I will be serving as the moderator for this evening's online meeting of our Planning Commission. We are streaming this meeting on our website, arapahogov.com. The agenda tonight will be handled in the same way it would be handled for a regular in-person meeting. You may stream the meeting on our website or call in to participate. Please be aware that the website broadcast is delayed by 20 to 30 seconds. So if you would like to speak regarding a public hearing item this evening, please use the call in number. To participate live via phone, call 719-569-5048. And when prompted, enter the conference ID 306-524-2000. Two nine one, followed by the pound sign. All presentation PowerPoints are available on our website, so even if you participate by telephone, you can still download the PowerPoints and follow along live with the presenters. Chair Rick, please proceed with the approval of the minutes. Okay, we have one set of minutes to approve from the October 6th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. If there are any changes to the minutes, and please include those changes in your motion, and I will accept a motion to approve the minutes unless we have any suggested alterations. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Wallman. I'd like to move to approve the minutes of Tuesday, October 6, 2020. Thank you, Commissioner Wallman. Do we have a second for approving the minutes? If Commissioner Latsis will second. Commissioner Latsitz has seconded the motion made by Commissioner Woolman. Any discussion? Otherwise, Mr. Reynolds, please call the roll. Commissioner Brockelman? Aye. Commissioner Miller? Aye. Commissioner Saul? Aye. Commissioner Save? Aye. Commissioner Woolman? Aye. Chair Pro Tem Latsis? Aye. Chair Rick? Aye. The minutes are approved on a vote of seven to zero. The public is invited to participate in the public hearing this evening. And if you would like to comment on the public hearing item, please call 719-569-5048. And when prompted, enter the conference ID 306-524-291, followed by the pound sign. I will call on individual telephone numbers after the Planning Commission Chair opens the public hearing. Each speaker will have three minutes to address the Planning Commission on the topic after the staff presentation. The applicant and staff will respond to any questions after all members of the public have spoken. Some of the public hearing items are quasi-judicial in nature. In order to afford all parties due process under law, the Planning Commission members must be fair and impartial in deciding whether those applications should be approved, approved with conditions, or denied. In making that determination, each member of the Planning Commission must consider the record, which includes the staff recommendation, the applicant presentation, public comment presented during the hearing, and other written public comments offered before or during the hearing. Under law, Planning Commission must evaluate the proposals based entirely upon the record and the criteria established under the Land Development Code. Those criteria are highlighted in the staff report. It is important that each Planning Commission member remain objective and capable of considering information offered into the record during this hearing. 
Does any planning commission member believe that he or she is incapable of evaluating and voting on the application in an unbiased and objective manner? Believe that they may have a conflict of interest or have any other matter that he or she would like to disclose prior to proceeding with the public hearing for the public hearing item on tonight's agenda? Well, hearing, hearing no enough. disclosures, I will turn this over to the chair. Okay, tonight we have one public hearing item. The Planning Commission will now consider a proposed plan unit development zoning case, SVP Z20-004, the Comcast parking lot specific development plan and Cat Hammer with the County Planning is a staff presenter. Ms. Hammer, please begin. Good evening, Chair, thank you, and good evening, Commissioners. Please note that this agenda item has been properly noticed and the PC has jurisdiction to make to proceed in making recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners. Um, I'm going to start sharing the screen here, so um, just give me a minute here. OK, um, I have provided a PowerPoint as part of the agenda. Um, and on page two, you will see um, the slide that is titled Proposal. Um, Doug Porter, who is the manager of real estate Comcast <coughs> West Division, on behalf of the property owner Compa Comcast ABB Network Solutions, is proposing a surface parking lot to serve the Comcast building in the Isla Business Park, which is directly north of this um, proposed site. The proposal includes approximately 200 parking spaces, circulation aisles, two access points, one from um, South Trenton and the other from um, East Harvard, pardon me. And the proposal also includes lighting and landscaping and three rain gardens to provide stormwater quality. On page three of the presentation titled Proposal Vicinity Map, you will see um, a map of the site highlighted in red and the um, zoning for sites adjacent and in close proximity to this site. Um, to the north is the East Ilift um, office buildings that we, or Ilift Business Park office buildings that we spoke about earlier. Um, and this proposal will be providing uh, parking for one of the buildings that is located up north there. Um, to the east is the Cherry Creek Greenway and across the Greenway is multifamily. Um, which is not included in a subdivision. To the south, um, there's single family and multifamily homes and as part of this Highland Glen subdivision. And to the west um, are more office buildings, part of the Ilifts Business Park. On page four, you'll see a slide that's titled Process. This application does qualify for the two-step PUD process. If this process proposal is approved by the BOCC, it would establish zoning for this parcel. And if approved, the applicant will need to submit for an administrative site plan and receive approval from staff prior to any building permits being issued. On slide five, titled background, um, the parcel is approximately 4.5 acres, currently zoned I-1 and is currently vacant. The four square mile designation, the four square mile sub area plan designates this land as suitable for employment uses. And the parcel is part of the Ilift Business Park subdivision approved by the county in 1982. On slide six, titled Discussion, Comprehensive Plan, and LDC. As stated in the staff report, um, the proposal meets a number of policies and goals outlined in the Comprehensive Plan, the four square mile sub area plan, and the criteria required for approval of an SDP to establish zoning. On slide seven, titled Discussion, External Referrals. Um, the external referral comments for this proposal can be found on page six of the staff report that was attached to the agenda. Um, Tri-County Health did provide a recommendation to consider internal pedestrian walkways or sidewalks. Um, pedestrian circulation is provided and shown on the plan and it's incur and the applicant is encouraging um, pedestrians to use the sidewalks that are proposed along the perimeter of the site. Pavement markings will be considered at the time of construction if deemed necessary during during the final site planning and signage may also be added during the final site planning to the direct pedestrians to the main Comcast building and walkways. 
Staff has reviewed all the other referral agency responses and the applicant's response to those comments and believes all requests have been satisfied from external referrals. On slide eight, titled Staff Findings and Recommendation, um, staff finds that the proposal generally conforms to the Arapahoe County Comprehensive Plan as well as the four square mile sub area plan. And staff also finds that the proposal meets the Arapahoe County zoning regulations and procedures um, for a planned unit development. That being said, staff is recommending approval of case SDPZ 20-004 Comcast accessory parking lots specific development plan subject to one condition of approval. That can be found in the staff report. On slide nine titled specific development plan step two of the three step PUD process. Um, the planning commission has four options in regard to the SDP application. The planning commission may recommend approval of the application with staff recommended conditions of approval. The planning commission may recommend approval of the application with revised conditions of approval. Um, the planning commission may recommend denial and the planning commission may also continue the public hearing to another date if necessary. <clears throat> I stand for any questions you may have, and there are two applicants who are on the line um, who represent the applicant. There are two people on the line who rep represent the applicant. They do not have a formal um, presentation, but um, I do believe they have um, a few words to say to the planning commissioners. So they can go ahead and then we'll ask questions when they're completed. OK, we have on the line Doug Porter and Chris Day. So um, I believe it's star three to unmute, unmute yourself. Good evening, this is uh, Doug Porter. Thank you for presenting that uh, cat. Um, I represent Comcast, uh, real estate manager for West Division. And we are looking to improve a property that uh, has been vacant and undeveloped for many years to um, accessorize our parking over at the ILF facility to accommodate additional employees uh, that we intend to hire in the near future. We currently have a parking situation that only allows 522 uh, parking spots and our capacity in the building is over a thousand. So I believe this would allow us to bring more jobs into um, the county and, and our facility. Okay, thank you. Is anybody up? <clears throat> I guess I'll go back and ask the planning commission if they have any questions of staff at this point. <laughs> any questions? No, ma'am. No. I guess I was curious why the variance was granted for the four foot wide um, sidewalk that and maybe that's going to improve the, the current conditions there. Uh, it, it seems unusually narrow. I can speak to that a little bit, but I'll ask Chuck to confirm. It's my understanding that there were um, when the applicant came in um, for pre submittal. Um, improvements to Harvard had were not planned or were not constructed after the applicant submitted their application with I believe it was an originally um, a five foot side five foot um, wide sidewalk um, improvements to East Harvard East Harvard had occurred and um, the engineering department de um, determined that waiving that five foot minimum requirement um, was something to keep good faith because of those improvements on East Harvard. OK, thank you for that. And I'm also curious about the security that will be offered, or is that just a reflection of the neighborhood where it is, or is there something else? So the applicant has indicated that they will um, have patrols uh, or somebody will be patrolling that parking lot. Um, I'll ask them to touch um, more on that subject if uh, necessary. OK. Any other questions from the Planning Commission? OK, 
and we heard from the applicant. So <clears throat> I will ask, I guess I'm going to go through the list of you one by one and you have another chance to ask a question of the applicant or for staff. Commissioner Brockelman. I have no questions have no at this questions. time. Thank you. Commissioner Miller. I have no questions at this time. Commissioner Saul. No questions at this time. Save. No questions at this time. Commissioner Woolman. No questions. And Commissioner Latsis. Uh, no questions at this time. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, this is a public hearing and our moderator will call on individual telephone numbers to participate in the hearing. As a reminder, if you have questions, we will collect those and the applicant or staff will respond after all callers have offered their comments. Mr. Moderator. Thank you. We do currently have callers on the line and uh, there is one caller who is not represented by a planning commissioner or the applicant and that caller has the last four digits of the phone number 8248. Um, caller with the last four digits 8248 you are not muted and if you would like to speak you may begin doing so. You would have you will have three minutes to comment. All right thank you Mr. Moderator. Uh, my name is Roger Smith and I am a owner in Howell Construction, which is the property immediately to the west of the proposed site across South Trenton. And uh, we just want to say that we support this development. Uh, that lot has been an eyesore. We have a lot of views out that direction to the east from our office property, and we maintain our property in a very nice condition. And we very much would like to see the landscaping as well as the lighting and uh, it's security patrols as, as discussed uh, to improve our neighborhood. So uh, we, as, as probably the, the nearest neighbor and the one that sees this lot the most, we full heartedly support the project. Very good, thank you. That is the last caller. Okay, I guess we have already heard <clears throat> from the applicant and staff, are there any additional comments that anybody would like to make at this point? Hearing none, I will close the public hearing and we'll bring this item to the Planning Commission for a motion and discussion. And if there are any additional questions before I call for a motion on this specific development plan with zoning. If there any other, aren't any other questions, we will proceed to accept a motion regarding the proposal. Anybody willing? Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Wallman. I would like to make a motion. In the case of SDPZ 20-004, Comcast Accessory Parking Lot Specific Development Plan, the planning commissioners have reviewed the staff report, including all exhibits and attachments, and have listened to the applicant's presentation and the public comment as presented at the public hearing. I hereby move to recommend approval of this application based on the findings in the staff report subject to condition number one. Thank you, Commissioner Woolman. Do we have a second for the motion? Commissioner Brockelman seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Brockelman. We have the motion made by Commissioner Woolman, seconded by Commissioner Brockelman. Is there any further discussion? And Mr. Reynolds, then please call the roll. Commissioner Brockelman. Aye. Commissioner Miller. Aye. Commissioner Saul. Aye. Commissioner Save. Aye. Commissioner Woolman? Aye. Commissioner Latsis? Aye. And Chair Rick? Aye. Uh, the motion passes on a vote of seven to zero. Very good. Thank you. This concludes our public hearing items and the public is invited to listen to our study session. However, no comments will be taken during this study session 
We will now hold the session regarding proposed updates to our energy regulations for oil and gas in Arapahoe County. Our presenter tonight is Diane Houtsis. Diane, please begin and welcome. Good evening, Madam Chair and commissioners and guests. Um, tonight we're going to share with you our oil and gas regulations process and our draft regulations. Um, before I, I uh, leave the introductory slide, I want to check if anybody has any questions from the PowerPoint that I sent last week that I call my um, oil and gas 101 PowerPoint. This is Commissioner Save, and I do have a question for you, Diane. Uh, not being at all familiar with oil and gas production. I just wanted to um, understand, is it common in um, in most of these production situations that it's a 24 seven operation or what are the typical hours of operation? Yeah, I'm having difficulty the, understanding. Uh, I oh, oh. Uh, uh, hmm. Shall I repeat? No. Did you change something? <laughs> Oh, OK, um, after they construct the pad and the access road and, and they do that during daylight hours, when drilling and fracking commences, those are 24 seven operations. They can't really stop drilling once drilling starts or the hole would collapse or the hole would become too wide, making it difficult to properly cement the hole. And, and the same goes for fracking to a large extent. They uh, put the tools down at the furthest extent of the lateral hole that they've drilled and they frack a, a, a series of intervals from that toe up to um, the vertical part of the well. And so that goes on pretty much 24 seven. The actual fracturing of the rock at below 7,000 feet does not have a sound at the surface, but there is the, the noisiest part of the entire operation is fracking and it's the pump trucks and the fans at the surface that make the most noise. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Sure. Does anybody else have any questions about protections in place for water or uh, Senate Bill 181 or anything else that I had in that presentation? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, well, then we'll we'll move forward with tonight's study session. Um, so uh, the goals of the study session are to summarize the board direction that we've received so far for our draft oil and gas rules, to inform you on the elements of our working draft oil and gas rules, and to obtain input on the outlined considerations. After a quick review of the direction we've received so far from the board, we'll proceed through the draft rule elements and they've been divided into four categories, health and safety, process improvements, operations, and quality of life. Um, bear in mind that we're using the following criteria for drafting rules and the criteria were approved by the board. Uh, public impact, alignment with state rules, best management practices, otherwise known as BMPs, industry impact, and impact to county resources. <clears throat> so regarding the quality of life direction the board has given us, we told them probably about a year ago now that we wanted to draft rules for noise, light, visual mitigation, traffic, and setbacks. Noise is the most frequent complaint we get from nearby residents. Uh, the, the lights are very bright, and so that's also a common um, complaint. And traffic, it probably comes in um, as the second or third complaint. Um, in the bottom row there, you'll see that we've proposed a setback of 1,000 feet from the edge of a pad to a property line of the nearest occupied building. Um, since we've drafted our rules, the state Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission is actually considering a 2000 foot setback that has rooms for exceptions to it. Um, and I, I just want to mention that either uh, which when there is a difference between the state rule and a county rule, the stricter of the two rules would apply. 
Um, but that's sort of off topic as far as direction we've received. So moving on to direction that we've received for health and safety, we told the board that citizens wanted us to regulate in some at some level air quality issues associated with oil and gas operations. And the board gave us two reasons why we shouldn't proceed with air quality rules. Um, one of the reasons was that the state health department, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, uh, would be updating their air quality rules. And in fact, they've already done that. Um, and those are their air quality rules specific to oil and gas operations. So they've made their rules even stricter. They were already uh, some of the strictest rules in the entire country, and now they're stricter. And um, the other reason the board didn't want us to pursue air quality regulations is because the county does not have an air quality expert. Air quality rules are um, extremely complicated. So then moving on in the list for health and safety, we told the board that we wanted to have emergency response plans or emergency action plans at the time of the initial application. Historically, we got those plans uh, months or even years after the facility was already in operation. We told uh, the board that we would provide the industry with a template that they could use for the emergency response plans. And then they could, uh, after GIS data was available, after the pad was constructed, they could provide a more detailed ERP or EAP. We told them that we wanted to require some sort of lightning mitigation because it's not uncommon for lightning to strike tanks on a pad and then um, after a tank ignites it's common for the neighboring tanks to also go up in flames and the uh, the smoke from um, a burning crude or even a, a, a burning produced oil tank is um, is really impactful uh, we wanted uh, firefighting supplies on on the site or near the site um, water and foam um, that foam approved by the fire district to be stored nearby. Uh, we wanted coordinated training between the operators and our emergency responders. Uh, uh, we wanted to get that set up prior to drilling and thereafter at regular intervals to be determined. We wanted uh, the operators to report all facility incidents uh, to emergency responders and those incidents would include spills, releases, fires, explosions, lightning strikes, accidents, chemical exposures. And then setbacks, it, uh, setbacks actually uh, apply to quality of life and health and safety. And um, our emergency responders were very supportive of a 1000 foot setback from the edge of the pad to the property line of the nearest occupied building so that that would give them room to respond to an emergency. And then we also told the board that uh, while this would not go into the oil and gas rules. It would go elsewhere in the land development code that we felt strongly that we should have some sort of reverse setback. Uh, that would be the setback between an existing oil and gas facility and um, a newly planned occupied building. We proposed several different reverse setback distances and the board uh, voted uh, amongst themselves to uh, give us direction forward for 250 feet. And then for process improvements, we told them that um, we would like the operators to have neighborhood meetings at um, pretty much at the time of application with the county and to provide um, more notice for applications. Uh, currently under our rules, the applicant of um, an oil and gas facility need only provide notice to the adjacent property owners, but we feel that oil and gas operations affect more than the adjacent parcels. So we want a notice to um, be sent to um, residents. Um, this slide is actually slightly outdated. Our, our um, working draft rules has a provision for notification to residents within one mile, and we've gotten um, citizen input on that where uh, citizens feel that that radius should be extended to two or even three miles. Recordation, uh, we, would, we would like uh, the approvals to be recorded. We had a, uh, an instance where we approved an oil and gas pad 
and at the time it, uh, Conoco was the main operator in the county and they went to that pad two or three years later to uh, because they had scheduled a rig and um, intended to start working on it and they found that somebody had uh, constructed a trailer on that site pretty much in the center of where they plan to put the pad and we feel that if the record uh, if the approvals were recorded at the clerk and recorder's office we might avoid that sort of situation in the future and it would be PWD uh, public work staff that would um, do the recordation with the clerk and recorder's office um, under expiration currently our approvals um, expire after five years if a facility has not been um, if construction has not been commenced on that pad and we are um, proposing that the expiration uh, exp uh, that the approval expire in three years because the character of a neighborhood could really change in in less than five years there could be uh, a greater density of, of uh, homes in that area and then alternative locations that was something that was very much requested by some residents um, also known as an ALA and the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission is currently in rulemaking on several topics and that's one of them um, the board told us that they didn't want us to proceed with alternative location analysis but um, we've continued to dialogue with them right now our draft rules only have uh, a requirement for ALAs if the pad is proposed on county property. So um, how we'll do the rest of the slides is you know, they've been broken into topics and um, some of the topics require more than one slide. And um, I, I wanna advise you that, you know, the, the tables are really a summary of our rules and We've got a more complete set of our rules in the working draft regulations available on the oil and gas website. And to keep things better organized tonight, we'll request your input at the end of each category. So um, now we're going to start with the health and safety rules. We have four slides for health and safety. <clears throat> we have uh, drafted a requirement for both emergency action plans and tactical response plans. Both of these plans were um, re requested by our emergency responders, our Office of Emergency Management, uh, Bennett Watkins Fire Rescue, who, uh, which is the fire district for most of the oil and gas locations. And, um, and I'm trying to think, um, one other agency requested that we do that. Um, and you can see that an emergency action plan by looking at the third column is something that other jurisdictions have either drafted rules for or they have existing rules for requiring these. Greeley also has a requirement for a tactical response plan. That's a plan that would set up the command structure for a response to an incident. Uh, we've also drafted a requirement for emergency access hardware that would aid uh, the emergency responders um, getting access to a site if it was locked. Uh, the emergency, we uh, want emergency act evacuation routes to be established and actually that provision would actually occur inside the emergency action plan or the tactical response plan. A hazardous materials inventory, um, our emergency responders ask for that as well. Um, we are, we have a, uh, in the drafted rules, we have a prohibition of storage of hazardous or floatable materials in floodplains. We have a requirement for a list of on-site chemicals because uh, that information would be uh, critical for emergency responders. And we've also drafted a requirement for inspections by fire districts and county staff. And two other jurisdictions have that requirement, Adams County and Bloomfield. And then um, our second to last slide on health and safety. Uh, for safety purposes, we want signs at all well pads that would allow emergency responders verification that they arrived at the correct facility. 
We want damage to county infrastructure caused by the operator's emergencies to be the responsibility of the operator. That would relieve the county of potential expenses. We want coordinated training between the fire districts and our Office of Emergency Management. We want uh, certificates of completion of FEMA NIMS training. Um, this is something that was um, heavily suggested by our emergency responders and Adams County also has that requirement. And we want the operators to follow the fire codes and standards of the local fire district office. There's um, been some confusion in the past as to what code they would use. But for instance, if they're within the fire district for Bennett Watkins Fire District, the operator would be obliged to follow the, the rules and codes of the Bennett Watkins Fire uh, Rescue de uh, de Department. And then um, we'd like the operators to store water and foam near the pads to aid in firefighting. We want uh, incident reports of all these different kinds of incidents, spills, releases, fires, explosions, lightning strikes, accidents, fatalities, injuries, chemical exposures, and any events requiring medical attention. Um, spill reporting, uh, any report that would be required by the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, we want to be filed with us also. And that would be information that uh, we could discuss at an annual meeting with operators. We want operators to report spills of all flammable, flammable materials of uh, five gallons or more. Um, our emergency responders have said that that would be helpful information to them um, if they have to respond to um, a site emergency. And we want spill response kits to be carried uh, by the field staff of the operator or to be stored at each pad. Those would be um, absorbent materials that um, could aid in stopping small spills from spreading further. Did I hear a question? OK, um, so here we have our last slide for health and safety. Um, as I mentioned, we've drafted a, a setback rule for um, 1,000 feet from the edge of the pad to the nearest property. And um, that setback rule includes a, um, a um, minimum of 250 feet from the property line. And that's a little bit confusing. So we have some slides that we'll jump to now to illustrate our setback rules. Um, oh, and here's, here's just a quick summary. Um, again, 1,000 feet from the edge of the pad to the nearest occupied structure or 1,000 feet from the edge of the pad to the boundary of the nearest platted lot, and 250 feet from the boundary of an adjacent parcel, and a 250-foot reverse setback. No new structures within 250 feet of an existing oil and gas pad. So the first photograph here um, is the simplest case. No pads within a 1,000-foot circle. That's a 1,000 feet from the edge of the pad in either direction. Then the next slide shows uh, what would happen if we had a reverse setback of 250 feet. Um, in, in many cases, uh, the owner of a small parcel would be burdened by a reverse setback um, because they wouldn't be able to build within 250 feet of the edge of a pad. So that um, this orange area illustrates the buildable area um, for the owner of an adjacent small parcel. But the next slide shows that um, if the operators are required to construct a pad with 250 feet of separation between the pad and the next nearest parcel, that allows uh, the owner of a small parcel, shown in orange um, up above, that allows that parcel owner to build on their entire parcel, except for the setbacks that would be applicable. But it opens up a lot more of their parcel um, for, for them to build on. So then going back to the table in slide 11, um, 
the operator sh shall maintain a 350 foot setback from buried infrastructure. I drafted that rule based on information that we had from Broomfield where they discovered that um, there was uh, buried infrastructure related to pads that had been abandoned and torn down years ago that was still on the ground that hadn't been abandoned properly. And, and there was um, um, flow lines and pipelines associated with some of those facilities. And so they recommended a 350 foot setback from um, buried infrastructure. However, when we had a meeting with industry, um, they explained to us that um, this really isn't workable because it's really common for operators to share the same easements when they install uh, pipelines and other kinds of infrastructure such as flow lines. So we're gonna be modifying that um, in the future. Um, this is how it appears in our draft rule right now, but but we're going to uh, work with industry to come up with a modification for that one. And then um, the last one, operators shall provide maps of all off pad flow lines. This turns out to be very complicated also because the, uh, well, the reason behind this rule was we were trying to avoid the kind of situation that resulted in Firestone from an explosion where um, a flow line was severed and leaked and um, um, leaked into the into the basement methane leaked into the basement of an adjacent home and um, and then um, caused a severe explosion. Um, but our operators are telling us that they would like us to hold that information confidential if they provided the flow line maps. However, under CORA, uh, we would have to reveal that information if we received it. So this is something that we're also going to meet with industry about and, and try to refine this rule a bit. So I guess we're ready for um, slide 16. Um, do any of you have any questions regarding the health and safety rules, or do you have any changes that you would recommend for our draft health and safety rules? This is Commissioner Lasher, I have a couple questions. Um, so I guess my first question would apply to most of the section, but like for example, on the emergency evacuation routes, I know in previous cases, I think it was Prosper actually where we had talked about evacuation routes, especially in proximity to residential or you know existing um, occupied buildings that they had to have two uh, uh, routes to get in and out of a drilling site. Is so is that level of detail going to be contained in you know a, a deeper dive kind of document than this, or are those things still being worked out? This is Jason. I muted Diane because she was causing an echo when you spoke. So I'll <laughs> give her a moment to unmute herself so she can talk again. Okay. All right. <laughs> I was starting to explain without without being unmuted. Um, yes, this is something that has come up in the past. Uh, the fact that um, two neighborhoods out east only had one route in and out of their safe sub subdivision. So um, this is something that would be addressed in either the emergency action plan or the tactical response plan. Uh, this is something that the operators and our emergency responders would, would work out together. Okay, Does so that, there's not going to be a standard like all sites must have two points of um, you know, egress or to evacuate. It's it's dependent on like Bennett could say one thing, South Metro could say one thing, so it's not going to be a standard. Is that correct? Um, I, I would have to say from from working with our emergency responders that they're pretty much in agreement um, on every single issue that we've raised with them. So I would expect they would all have the same standard. OK, but it's not required. No. Not not at this point, um, but that's something that we can bring up with them. Yeah, I guess that one would make me a little uncomfortable because that could be, you know, 
that could be a, a real problem if one person said, oh, one access point's fine, and then they have the accident out there, and it, you know, basically doesn't allow people to evacuate. But, right. um, you know, that's that's one thought I, or question I had or concern. Um, my other question, and, you know, I think it's a good idea to shorten the timeline to three years from five as far as taking action on a permit. Um, but what happens, so let's say, like you said, things change quickly. Um, they have a permit on a site and then somebody builds something next to it. How does that whole setback thing work? I mean, it could negate their ability to work on the site um, and they had a permit. Is it is the recordation supposed to address that or, you know, because certainly in three years, if somebody owns an adjacent parcel and they sell it to a developer, it could be off and running by the time the, um, you know, the uh, operator decides to come in. So how will those setbacks be addressed and enforced? Um, that, that is a really good question um, because the situation I described where somebody constructed a trailer on a site where Conoco had planned to put a pad, um, that happened on the site itself. Uh, 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 the, the property was sold and right. the former owner did not inform the new, uh, the, the purchaser that that there was an oil and gas pad approved for that site. But I, I don't think we've actually considered that there would be um, a conflict due to construction on an adjacent parcel. Right, yeah, because your one picture where you showed it kind of shoving the buildable envelope off to the, the north or, you know, that one suggested to me, well, that could really, that could happen if the person on that parcel, you know, had gone through the process and was able to build, you know, there could be a, a permanent home, not a trailer with foundation, et cetera, you know, in direct conflict with that pad. Mm -hmm. Especially if they take three years, you know, so I'm just curious right. how that's going to be monitored. I can address that if you like. <clears throat> sure. This is Bob. Hi, Bob. The First of all, the reverse setback would be intended to prohibit that um, property from going in. But even if it doesn't, you know, forever, it doesn't get recorded or the pad's not there and there's no reason to believe it. Once the pad has been permitted at its location, if someone builds with it, it will have been required to meet the setback at the time the permit was approved. And if someone comes after the fact and puts a, a property within that setback, that wouldn't inhibit the developer or the oil and gas from going forward in, in my mind anyhow. OK, so if someone violated that, you know, assuming the recordation is all in place and they would have to essentially, you know, demo their building. Yeah, we, we probably it would probably be on the county to catch that at the building permit stage. Um, with the recorded approval and we would hopefully theoretically anyhow say you know, you know sorry you can't build there you're within the reverse setback assuming a reverse setbacks been adopted right interesting you might have to require title searches before permit from everybody <laughs> So, so Bob this is Commissioner Wallman I mean it seems to me if you're having um the requirement that the permit be recorded, that anyone who's out there who's adjacent, as Catherine has said, um, would instead of putting the onus on the county to do that search, um, I, I would like to see the onus put on the on the developer of the adjacent property to do that. I mean, I'm just looking at it from an expense, you know, an expense time management um, resource kind of uh, situation. Yeah, yeah. Well, to me, well, to it's, me it's, kind it's kind of an, kind of an interesting, interesting title, title situation, situation because, because you would because typically, you typically do a title, do a title search on your, on property, your property. And I don't yeah, know that, I don't you, know that would you would have a mechanism, have a mechanism to pick up, pick up something on an adjacent, adjacent property. property. 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, and I understand that. That's not usually the typical thing when somebody goes, um, you know, to, to develop an area of whatever nature. Um, and I don't know whether, um, you know, if something's obviously, you know, not developed, it's not like, you know, the, the developer can get a visual cue as to what is going on on an adjacent property. I do I think do that will be caught at the, the building permit stage. stage. Okay. Generally. Generally, assuming they get a building permit. Okay, thank you. And Diane is Diane muted is again, muted just, just FYI. FYI. And the and echo the is coming from Commissioner Woolman. Okay, if there's no further questions about the health and safety drafted rules, we'll go on to um, the operational requirements. The first three of these rules relate to secondary containment. Um, EPA has rules that um, are, are now enforced by, by Colorado, um, the, the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission for uh, secondary containment so that if a tank was to leak, that uh, the contents of the largest tank would be contained within that secondary containment. Um, and that's the case for the large storage tanks on site and the smaller tanks also. So we're gonna flip to um, two pictures to um, illustrate this. On the left, um, it, you can see along the bottom that well, along the bottom third of the photo, that that um, there is a steel wall, and that wall has attached to it a synthetic liner, and that containment is designed um, to cover an area and a height that provides the containment of the volume of the largest tank in inside that secondary containment. That's the EPA, EPA rule that um, we now have jurisdiction over. That is what you commonly see in Arapahoe County. However, on the right, this photo actually on the right was not taken in Arapahoe County, but the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission permits these berms to be built out of uh, compacted dirt. And then um, the, the newest trend is to ar armor these compacted dirt berms with cobbles to make them more resistant to being worn down by wind and rain and, and um, snow. Because if an earthen berm is uh, weathered and it's reduced in height, its capacity to hold the volume of the largest tank would be compromised. <clears throat> so we had never really considered um, prior to talking to COGCC, we'd never really considered moving forward with earthen berms, but they have assured us that um, these armored berms are just as effective as the steel berms. And then the next picture, this shows secondary containment around small tanks. So on the left, this type of tank would be used to store ethylene glycol at, at an oil and gas pad. And the, the photo on the right is um, containment for um, lubricating oil uh, on a site. So we can go back to slide 17. There we go. Um, um, moving down to the fourth row, new technologies required if new technologies for surface operations are technologically sound, economically practical, and reasonably available to the operator. Um, we like that rule. We saw it in Aurora, Aurora's proposed rules and um, also in Broomfields. And this is something that we would discuss at an annual meeting with the operators. And then um, untreated produced water will not be used for dust control. This hasn't been done widely, but um, we want to get this codified to make sure it, it doesn't happen um, because produced water um, contains hydrocarbons and um, and a high concentration of dissolved solids, which can contaminate soil adjacent to roads, and then um, the vegetation will die. And three other jurisdictions have this kind of rule. 
And then um, facilities located outside of floodplains unless no other sites can be reasonably used. It, <clears throat> just in the past week with internal discussions, we've decided not to allow facilities in floodplains at all. So, um, do you have any um, questions or um, input on the draft operational rules? Yes, Commissioner Latsis again. Um, you know, having worked with the SEMSWA, with SEMSWA at the county, uh, one question that occurs to me is, are any perimeter uh, BMPs required? You know, because I know we're talking about making them do fencing and a lot of these pictures don't show fencing. Do they have to put any straw wattles or anything around the perimeter of these sites to make sure nothing leaves their site and goes into the adjacent you know, properties or, you know, um, landscaping, et cetera. Because right now I could see a tank would have to be contained, but, you know, the overall site, generally in construction, we have to contain the entire site. So I was just curious if there's anything for that. We do address those, um, those provisions to um, make sure that stormwater and other fluids don't get off the site in our guest rules, the grading erosion and sediment control rules. So th those are engineering standards. Okay, great. So that's that's part of their whole permitting process then. Right, right. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh -huh. Does anybody else have any questions about the operation rules? Okay, if none, then we can go on to slide 21. Process improvements. Um, so a lot of these are things that we've had on our wish list for years while we were operating under the MOU system, the Memorandum of Understanding. We had um, things come up during the seven years where, where all we had to regulate was the MOU because local governments um, did not have um, control. And neighborhood meetings is something that we um, encouraged operators to have if they had a controversial site, but this would um, codify that requirement. And then, as I mentioned before, written notification of the application for all landowners of record and HOAs within one mile. We may expand that one mile radius to, to two miles based on citizen input. Sign posting at the time of application. Um, we can flip to slide 22 to show an example of a site uh, a sign that Conoco erected. We did not have it in our rules that the applicant would have to post a sign at the time they filed an application with us, but uh, Conoco worked with us on that and um, was willing to construct a sign each time they submitted an application. So that worked out well, but that needed to be codified in our rules. Um, next is waiver requests. Um, our rules are being written with a tiered approach so that sites located near neighborhoods or sites with um, above a certain level of number of wells or tanks on them would have would be subject to more mitigations than sites that are very remote or sites that only have one or two wells and um, a limited number of tanks and other equipment on site. So the waiver request process um, works for um, for the tiered the tiered process. Um, um, so waiver examples would be setbacks, neighborhood meetings, annual meetings between the operator and the county termination date of approval, um, visual mitigations, noise mitigation, and lightning mitigations. Um, an example could be that if a uh, property is uh, that uh, is proposed for a pad is a large property and the owner of, of that property doesn't want um, visual mitigations to be placed or um, has no issues with the with the sounds that um, that have been um, provided in the uh, the sound modeling plans that operators do. If if that service owner doesn't want these provisions, then that they would be waived. And um, the waiver process would be that um, these things would be approved by the director of public works. Operators are very very happy with this proposed rule and um, citizens have some reservations about it. 
but two other jurisdictions have this kind of a process. Uh, regular meetings, at least annually, we're thinking of increasing that to twice annually. That would allow the county to sit down with the operators on, on, on at least a yearly basis and discuss their emergency response plans, their tactical response plans, any health and safety issues um, that have occurred through the year, and uh, potential imp implementation of new technology. Technology is always evolving, so um, we'd like um, the chance to discuss it at least every year. And that leads us to the row right below. New technology is required if the service operations are technologically sound, economically practical, and reasonably available to the operator. And that was taken pretty much from Aurora's draft rules. Uh, revocation of approval. This would be um, a way for the county to regulate failure to comply with our requirements. And Broomfield has it in their proposed rules. Recordation of approval with the clerk and recorder's office, we've already um, ex uh, talked about. And then um, we've already talked about expiration of approval in three years, unless the, unless the facility is substantially commenced. So now on to the uh, quality of life uh, uh, category and um, first we're going to cover noise. As I mentioned, it's the most common complaint that we get from uh, the neighbors of oil and gas facilities. Our residents out east are used to very low levels of noise, especially during the night. And um, if uh, drilling and fracking is going on near them, um, even if the sound is within the current state limits, the state is also working on new rules for noise. We, we still get a lot of complaints. And um, unfortunately, right now, because the state has not um, yet finished their, um, their, their rules for noise and the county has not, um, you know, we're still in this process, there's not a whole lot we can do for people. And uh, low frequency noise is a whole other level of uh, irritation to nearby uh, neighbors. It's estimated that approximately 5% to 6% of the population has a sensitivity to low frequency noise. I believe that estimate to be low because people don't even know they have that sensitivity unless something like this happens near them. And um, low frequency noise can really be thought of more as a vibration than a noise. So, um, any kind of noise, though, can really affect the health of, of people suffering from it. And not only would these neighbors be dealing with um, the noises associated with drilling and fracking, but they'd also be dealing with the noises from truck traffic. Um, and I also want to mention that um, if a, a noise um, is, is um, occurring at night when people are sleeping, they may not fully wake up and even remember that, that they were struggling with a noise while they were trying to sleep, but um, just the, the disturbance um, is going to impact their sleep cycle and it, and it then could lead to um, um, health impacts as well. So Broomfield set their nighttime noise limit at 45 decibels. Um, and just for a point of reference, a normal conversation is 60 decibels. So you can imagine con conducting drilling and fracking operations and trying to meet a 45 decibel limit is, is, has proven not to be practical. <clears throat> Broomfield's got, got a number of lawsuits um, in the works right now because of that really low limit. Boulder has a 50 decibel limit, which still really isn't uh, achievable. And Larimer has the same uh, limit. So we've proposed, uh, we originally have proposed a 65 decibel limit, but because COGCC is working through rules where uh, 60 decibels would be the nighttime limit, um, we we uh, want to we wanted to revise our rules to reflect that the the COGCC rule, and then um, we we've uh, drafted a requirement for an ambient noise survey, which could work in the favor of the operators. It may re relieve them of some noise mitigation requirements in noisy areas. 
So if, if the ambient noise is already considerable in that area, the operator may not be required um, to do um, full mitigation for noise. Noise modeling um, and noise mitigation plans are in our drafted rules. And noise modeling is something that industry does um, on a pretty regular basis when there's homes in the area. They hire a, uh, a, a company that specializes in sound and, and noise to, uh, to model the site topographically and um, predict whether the, the noise generated from either drilling or fracking will exceed the state noise levels. And we, we get copies of those um, uh, noise modeling plans, but we wanted to codify that. Um, and as I mentioned, we want to address low frequency noise. And um, <clears throat> we want operators to use the best available technology to reduce noise during drilling and completion. Um, that would include um, um, covering noisy equipment, um, uh, installing mufflers on noisy engines, that, that sort of thing. But recently, um, and you'll see this in the very last box on the, on the right, quiet technology has been in the news. There's a company called Liberty um, that I think has bought out Halliburton at this point, and they discovered an innovation for reducing fracking noises, you know, the actual hydraulic fracturing operation. And um, the, the operator in Arapahoe County who took over from Conoco is Crestone Peak Resources, and they plan on using this quiet technology. So that will um, definitely reduce the mid-range noise uh, frequencies. And then on to um, other noise mitigations. We've uh, drafted a requirement for electric drilling or production equipment where the equipment and power are available. Unfortunately, there are parts in the county where electric power would not be available. And um, sometimes an operator might not be able to acquire the services of a company with an electric drilling rig. Um, but um, I think those are gonna become more and more available as time goes on. And several other jurisdictions have required or are proposing a rule for electric drilling or production equipment. No unloading of tubular goods at night. So as you know, the drilling pipe is, is hollow steel pipe. And if they unload that or uh, tubing, which is um, a smaller diameter steel piping that, that um, goes um, into the well for production, if they unload those materials at night and the pipes clang on each other, they can make a really <laughs> um, loud, noisy environment. So we want to pro prohibit that at night. We want to prohibit um, engine idling or minimize engine idling. Um, that would not only reduce offsite noise, it would also reduce offsite odors. Heavy trucks and deliveries prohibited at night except were unavoidable. That reduces nighttime noise at neighboring properties along the roads. 24-hour uh, number posted for noise complaints. Um, that would be an operator, an operator phone number. And the reason um, we want the citizens to have the operator's 24-hour phone number is so that the operators receive the complaints in real time. Um, noise limit uh, last last line, noise limit more lenient where high ambient noise levels exist. Noise mitigations may be waived where high ambient noise levels are high. And that is actually unique to Arapahoe County. Yeah. Um, our rules, no other jurisdictions. Um, we did, we found no other jurisdictions with that um, rule. And then, Diana, yeah. oh, sure. Diana, this is Jane. I have a question about the noise. You said okay. it was for the most frequent complaint. Well, what's, what's the repercussion if somebody calls and says it's noisy? Is there a sanction against the operator or what's the process? Well, so currently we've, um, and for the last seven years, we've just been operating with the memorandum of understanding and that really doesn't give us any um, authority to, to regulate noise. 
Um, before Senate Bill 181, local governments did not have control over surface operations. So I would get complaints and I would talk to the operators to see if there was something they could do different. And because we really didn't have the authority, sometimes they would skirt the issue or they would postpone some kind of remedy. And um, then they, you know, I keep calling them and saying, OK, you know, three days have gone by. What have you done? And they'd say, well, we tried to do something, but it was going to impact the health and safety of the workers. So we didn't do that. And, and things would get dragged out for a while. And then finally, you know, um, on my fourth call or whatever, they would say, oh, we're going to be done in two days. And they weren't done in two days either. So um, this, we really feel that noise rules are an important part of, of our new regulations. But um, the uh, another tool that we've had and that I've used is to contact the COGCC inspector for Arapahoe County. And she has been really responsive and she goes out to sites at night when she does get noise complaints. And she has her own um, noise meters to measure the noise and to make sure that the operators are in compliance in compliance with the existing state rules. And recently, um, some citizens have just been contacting her directly, and then um, eventually she'll let me know that she's responded to three or four noise complaints in a period of a, of a few days. Okay, so you just try to get the, the noise to be changed, but there's no other, so you can't yank the permit right for noise okay yeah once drilling starts we you know we really can't shut it down and neither can the state um okay. so it, it's been suggested in the past that operators could place hay bales between the pad and the the neighbors that are being in, impacted with the noise but hay bales um while they are really effective for absorbing noise unfortunately they're a safety hazard they could catch fire you know um and then um People could, uh, equipment could bump into them. It's it, it's a safety hazard. So that solution hasn't been used um, very much recently. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, so I guess we're ready for slide 25. Yes, odor. Um, Odor is also a complaint for, for from nearby neighbors. Um, they um, smell a hydrocarbon odor that is associated with the drilling mud because uh, the drilling mud that they use when they drill past the aquifers is diesel based uh, commonly. So we have found out that, that operators can use low odor muds um, where there just aren't um, the same level of vapors that come off that mud it's a little more expensive but actually it, it turns out it's actually um effective to use because it saves the operators some money um, using this low odor mud they can recirculate more of it and this is a requirement in several other jurisdictions and it's a standard procedure for one of our operators so um, so far we haven't heard any objections about the, uh, requiring the use of low odor mud or, or other techniques. Also, they can cover their shale shakers. Um, th there's um, just other other um, measures they can take to reduce odors. Uh, we want the operators to use closed loop systems instead of open pits. When we uh, developed the MOU about, um, it was signed a little bit over seven years ago now, one of the operators that, that was in the county at the time, who no, who's no longer here, insisted that we have rules that allowed uh, open pits. Turns out when they finally drilled their well, they used a closed loop system. Even our small operators have used closed loop systems in the last seven years. <clears throat> um, and and um, so they would circulate the fluids through closed tanks, and that greatly reduces the odors that, um, that come off the fluids. So we've heard no objections from industry yet on that um, drafted rule. Um, the operator shall not plow hydrocarbon ba bearing drill cuttings into the surface soil. Um, that is something that has um, been done by operators historically. It saves them some money for um, transporting the, the drill cuttings offsite and for 
disposal. But when I spoke to the West Arapaho Soil Conservation District, they told me that this is not a good practice in Arapaho County. It may work in other areas, but in our soil, we just don't have the same amount of um, bacteria that eat hydrocarbons that's, um, that, it, that are present in other places. So um, it was a strong recommendation from the West Arapaho Soil Conservation District not to allow that practice. And um, Aurora has that in their proposed rules. And then um, operators shall pro proactively respond to and address odor compliance. Um, we want quick, quick re resolution to odor complaints. On to lighting. Um, these are measures that are pretty much um, in enforced by all the operators, but we wanted to codify them. Lights directed downward and inward, lights mounted on the inside of sound walls where sound walls are used, and uh, full cutoff or shielded lighting. And those um, those provisions are um, already in place or proposed in several other jurisdictions. And as I said, we haven't got any objections from industry yet. On to um, visual mitigation. So our proposed rules um, says that if a proposed pad is within a quarter mile of an occupied structure, platted lot, or parcel of 40 acres or smaller, the pad must be designed with some form of visual mitigation. And the operator can choose the form of visual mitigation. No visual mitigation would be required for pads that are greater than a quarter mile from an occupied structure. And we believe that would offer relief for future development and it would mitigate the views from roads and several other jurisdictions have that requirement. Um, visual mitigation installed with three, within three months of well completion. This is something we um, are gonna need to talk to industry about. We had strong objections about this drafted rule because they said that it makes no sense to install visual mitigation until they're done with interim reclamation. Interim reclamation is where they decrease the size of the pad from the, the large pad that's that's um, installed for drilling and fracking that's needed for all the traffic and all the equipment during drilling and uh, hydraulic fracturing, um, that pad can be shrunk and um, the area um, that, it, it, um, that, that um, <laughs> is outside of the shrinkage can be revegetated. Um, and the operators are saying that it makes no sense to install visual mitigation when um, until they've completed their interim reclamation. So we're gonna sit down with industry on that one. Privacy fencing, uh, colors and height, um, that would, we've uh, drafted that into the rules and um, we believe that hides the pad to a large extent. A lot of the equipment on the site, especially the separators are tall enough where they um, would still show above the fencing, but it, it would allow um, some visual relief for nearby residents <clears throat> and several other jurisdictions have that in their proposed or current rules. And then minimizing the size of tanks wherever possible. Um, that language comes from Boulder, Broomfield and Thornton. And, um, if an operator was to install tanks that were 16 feet high instead of like 22 feet high, that would go a long way towards reducing the visual impact. But um, <clears throat> we realized there might be circumstances where um, that might not be possible for them. And then on to traffic. We want to restrict traffic during commuting and school bus hours. We feel that that um, would enhance safety and congestion, and it would avoid potential accidents with school buses. And several other jurisdictions have that in their rules, um, which they may have taken from us because we've got that in our MOU. Um, use pipelines wherever available. Um, pipelines are uh, very expensive to install and have to be justified economically by some good producing wells before an operator can install them. And then it takes them about two years to permit them. But we'd like them to use pipelines wherever possible because that takes heavy trucks off the road. 
and several other jurisdictions have that rule. And then um, in our MOU, we encouraged operators to use temporary water lines for drilling and fracking because uh, uh, those lines would take a portion of the heavy truck traffic off the road. The, the water trucks are very heavy trucks that um, take a toll on our roads and several other jurisdictions have have that um, either in their current or proposed rules. And, and this is something that um, all of our operators have been doing for the past seven years. And then our last quality of life slide is wildlife, wetlands, riparian areas and streams. Um, we have a requirement that the operator must implement the recommendation of Colorado Parks and Wildlife unless waived in part by the Public Works Director, and that would be to protect wildlife and wildlife habitat. And that's actually when, when I prepared this table a couple of months ago for a board study session, that was unique to Arapahoe County. But since then, uh, COGCC has drafted a, a rule that's pretty much identical for this. Um, um, but they're not going to go into rulemaking for wildlife until November. Um, the second one is determine wetlands boundaries using a professional wetland scientist and then indicate those boundaries on the plan set. This was something that I got from uh, discussions with Col Colorado Parks and Wildlife as um, a way to preserve critical habitat and Boulder has that in their rules. Um, no construction within 300 feet of wetlands that would help pre preserve wetlands, which are part of critical habitat. And it looks like the state is actually um, proposing a rule and discussing a rule for uh, uh, a setback of 500 feet from wetlands or riparian areas. Um, bore under defied bed and bank. So instead of um, building roads or, or pads um, over streams, we would require that the operators bore under them no pads and riparian areas um, and that because those are critical to habitat um, bore under riparian areas for flow lines and pipelines use culverts for the crossing of riparian areas um, where where um, the riparian areas are to be crossed by access roads and um, fencing that bisect streams would be prohibited because wildlife use streams for migration and as you can see several of these were um, um, requirements that were requested by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. D um, so we just finished, that was actually quality of life. So, so um, um, this, this slide is really mislabeled. I, d do you, any of you have questions about the draft quality of life rules or um, any changes <clears throat> that we should consider for the draft quality of life rules? This is Jamie. Um, I do have a question about what situations um, would be considered for a revocation of a permit. Um, examples would be if, if they um, if they constructed an access road that went through a um, a riparian area without installing. Uh, culverts, um, um, if they um, repeatedly did not come into compliance with either ours or the state's noise rules, um, basically it would, it would be um, compliance issues. So I heard you say that once they start drilling, um, there you, you know, in the past under regulations that were captured in a memorandum of understanding you know you pointed out that there were noise violations you kind of have to let them go so that to me um would not be one of your grounds for one of the grounds for revocation and i have to ask if you're going to revoke somebody's permit um do they have an opportunity for a hearing uh at least administratively um, yes, they, they would um, have have the opportunity for hearing. But um, as far as noise, um, what I was um, 
meaning to, to state is that under our current system, where, where we regulate through the MOU, we have no teeth as a local jurisdiction. So um, we were not able to regulate noise, but under our uh, drafted rules, if, if approved by the board, we would have um, the legal standing to regulate noise. Okay. Okay, that, that answers that question. I just wanted to make sure that the permit holder um, would have an opportunity to be heard. You know, a little, little due process is always a good thing in life. Yes. Yeah, uh, this Thanks. Commissioner Latzis, sorry. Um, I had a follow on question to Jamie's question uh, regarding things like odor and noise and, you know, and, and rule violations. Are you going to quantify you know, what would result in a significant violation so that operators would know ahead of time. Let's say if I get 10 noise violations in 30 days, then I'm going to get pulled in front of the county. You know, are you going to have like some specifics around what rule violations are, you know, maybe more serious than others or how many chances do you get before you get in trouble? You know, so are you going to basically put some criteria around that? Um, as they're currently drafted, we haven't. Um, Bob, could you chime in on this? Um, well, largely the enforcement will have to be through zoning enforcement. Um, and under zoning enforcement per state statute, we have to, before we can file any, any action in court, to enforce it, we have to give them a 10 day notice and opportunity to correct the problem. So, right. so in that regard, yes, you know, they wouldn't suddenly, you know, find themselves with a summons to, you know, pulled into court, you know, because they had a noise complaint against them. Sure. Uh, but I mean, to keep it all in an equal playing field, are you going to say, look, if you hit a certain threshold of noise complaints, you're going to get a warning. And if you continue to get noise complaints, then you get a second warning. And you know, at what point will it result in disciplinary action? Because I can see if you said, you know, one guy was a bad operator and somebody else is a bad operator, but they did different things or had different levels of compliance, you know, that would give them a, a precedent issue, like, well, hey, you didn't bust that guy for 10 violations, but you busted me, you know. So I'm just curious mm -hmm. if you're gonna spell it out and say, these are the, the penalties for violating these rules, and this is how we're going to do it. Yeah, that's something we actually should take a, a closer look at, because just from my perspective alone, zoning enforcement's not the most effective. Um, it kind of depends on staff and, uh, and time and, you know, ability to take cases to court and the whole bit. Um, if there is a better way to do it, I would certainly argue for it. Well, I, I would support doing that laying out criteria just I think it, it keeps it. It also tells the operators what's important to the county. Um, if you say these type of rule violations are going to result in some some problems for you, then they might try to avoid them. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really timely discussion because we have an internal meeting on Thursday morning to try to um, tighten up some of some of our rules. Oh, great! So with that, I I also think that guidance to Bob's point and Catherine raises a really good um, point is something that would be appreciated really um, by by the operators. I mean, I think I think guidance is important in order to achieve compliance, right? So that you're not reactionary. Um, to Bob's point, if you have to go enforce um, standards via zoning actions, it may not be the best way because it happens, you know, at the tail end or when things have gotten beyond the point of no return, right? So guidance at, at the initial phase is just a lot more useful all around, I think. I, I agree. Uh, are there any other questions or suggestions? 
So this is financial be penalties if people don't comply with the county's rules. We have not drafted anything along those lines. We got some initial direction from the board that um, that we should avoid that because the state already has financial penalties in place. Okay. But we've heard that from citizens that the state's financial penalties that they currently have in place are are pretty minor. Um, however, I, I do think that the COGCC is also taking a look at, at, at penalties as part of their rulemaking process. OK, thank you. This is Commissioner Brockelman. Since sound needs or seems to be a very critical element to all of this operation, would it be um, where you could require a, um, what should I say, a compliance report from the operator, let's say on a weekly base or a monthly base, something like that, because they could certainly set up uh, meters around the site and capture that kind of data and then furnish the report back to the county. Would that be something that could help us out? Um, the, the guidance we've gotten from the board on um, on requiring multiple reports is they feel like that would be an unfair burden on industry. But um, yeah, this is something we can bring up at future meetings. Diane, this is Commissioner Save, and I um, just I had a question that's on a uh, kind of broader level, and that is, and you may or may not know the answer, but since you've been studying this so closely, I just wondered what the forecast is or the prediction for the growth of this industry in general. Um, I'm thinking that because I'm wondering. Is this going to be something that uh, we as a county are going to be dealing with more and more over many, many years? Or do you or, or does the literature indicate that it's more of a transitional issue? I, I just wonder if you could weigh in on that and give me some context. Um, it's really up in the air right now. Industry is saying that if uh, the county adopts strong rules, and the state adopts a lot of the rules that they're currently discussing uh, amongst themselves, the, the uh, new full-time um, commissioners at the COGCC. Industry is saying that they could uh, potentially be driven out of the state by really strict rules. But right now, um, the price of oil is really low um, due to a lack of demand, or at, at least I haven't actually checked the price in the in the last week or so but the the price uh -huh. crashed um when the the pandemic first hit and it, more for another shirt, it just wasn't the demand so um that's impacted the fact that we haven't received any permit applications recently um but as as far as the longevity of of these sites um we, well before i before i talk about that uh, we we have one operator, um, Crestone Peak Resources, who has stated that if the price of oil is forty dollars a barrel or more, that they would be able to make a profit and they would proceed on um, development. Um, however, um, larger companies, their predecessor Conoco, would have needed the price of oil to be uh, fifty or fifty-five dollars a barrel at least for them to proceed with with drilling. Um, and, and then I just want to mention that right now it's projected that these um, the, the wells, the shale wells in the Niobrara Formation could last 20 years, but there's no real data on how long a, um, a shale well lasts because the very first shale wells were installed in North Dakota in the Bakken Formation which is also a shell, and um, um, those wells were installed uh, the early part of the 2000s, I would say. They, they might have started 2003, 2004, so we don't have a lot of data on how long these wells will last. 
but um, we know that these facilities uh, are, are something that are going to be in a neighborhood or in an area for quite a while. It, it, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Okay. Are there any other questions? Um, okay, so here's an update on our um, schedule and um, outreach process. In September, we published our draft regulations on our oil and gas website and we conducted stakeholder outreach with four groups. We combined all our citizen groups into one citizen meeting. Um, in our industry meeting, we met with operators and midstream companies, which are pipeline companies and um, their consultants and industry um, organizations, such as the American Petroleum Institute and the Colorado Oil and Gas Association. We met with developers and builders and combined that meeting with chambers of commerce and um, we met with state agencies and that included Colorado Parks and Wildlife, COGCC, CDPHG, and the State Land Board. Um, so we did all of that in September and then in October on the 7th we conducted a virtual public meeting for our oil and gas rules and um, um, tonight we're, we're here at the uh, Planning Commission study session Earlier today, we had a Board of County Commissioner study session also, which was, I believe, um, the 11th study session that we've done with the board since we started our rules process. And then on November 10th, uh, that's the, the planned date for the Planning Commission public hearing. And on November 24th, that's the planned date for the BOCCC public hearing and adoption of rules. And both of those hearings, you know, would have um, allow public comment. Um, the survey is like the third to last opportunity for all stakeholders to participate and, and provide comments and then the two hearings. Um, I have to say though that the November 10th and November 24th hearing dates are not entirely set in stone. Um, we're going to see um, when we meet with the board for another, another study session um, a week from today if, if we want to hold um, firm on those dates. And um, we do encourage all of you to also take the survey. Uh, the survey has questions about the draft rules and then it has comment boxes where you can insert comments about that draft rule. And then at the end of the survey, there's a comment box where you can um, um, summarize your comments or, or provide your specific comments in, in that box. And the survey closes on October 28th, but we really appreciate getting comments sooner so that we can bring those comments to the board sooner. Thank you, Diane. You've given us a lot of food for thought. I, some of uh, the commissioners have already asked questions. Are there any additional questions at this time from anyone? Yeah. Well, he hearing none, we will say thank you and conclude our study session. So thank you, Diane. Thank all of you very much. And our next Planning Commission meeting is scheduled for November 10th, which we have been advised will be a public hearing. Are there any additional staff announcements? Certainly, just a reminder that uh, if anyone who's happening to watch this broadcast wants to comment on the oil and gas regulations, they can visit arapahogovcom slash oil and gas, all one word, and view the draft regulations and take that survey. We'd really appreciate the feedback. And Thank that's you. the only announcement that I have. Well, hearing none and hearing no further questions, I announce that this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.